In a minute, I'll have you turn to our scripture. Um, <clears throat> have a couple of things I want to mention. Um, <clears throat> a prayer request I would like to give you. Um, I'm kind of hesitant at uh, times to mention uh, things in my sphere of life. Um, but um, <clears throat> our son Jonathan was just hired a month or two ago to teach theology at Indiana Wesleyan University. Um, that's in Marion, Indiana. And we um, were back there earlier helping them move. And also they just um, had the arrival of their second child, um, little girl, and she's now five weeks old. Um, they're getting ready to start school, and I think it was Tuesday morning, I'm not certain. Um, but Christy, our daughter-in-law, received a diagnosis of an aggressive form of breast cancer. Um, and they do have a good doctor there, and the doctor in Fort Wayne, where they're going, um, I think is very competent, and <clears throat> also... Um, this doctor's teacher mentor is a cancer director at Mayo. And so they're going to go there at least for a second opinion. Um, it, it doesn't seem, they'll, get, they'll just get some help with what the plan is. Seems to have been caught early, but you know, those kind of things. It's a scary word, and I know a number of you here have already heard that word at times in your life. This is a first for me. Um, so I would just like to ask you to remember Christy in prayer and Jonathan as he, um, we may be going back there a little bit. They bought a house. They haven't moved in yet. They're getting ready to close on that. School district or school year starts in next week. I mean, it, it's, there's never a really good time to get a diagnosis like that. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> this especially is not a good time. But at any rate, I know God's not caught off guard and he knows all about it. And he's, um, words of that song we just sang are good. You know, our God's a healer, our God is powerful, and there is no God like our God. So, um, anyway, just pray for that if you would. Second, just a reminder to the council, those that are members of the council, um, we're going to have a quick meeting between services, so maybe let scrambling council members get to the front of the donut line. Um, <clears throat> you can't ask them to go without a donut during council meeting. So anyway, we'll meet in the conference room, but um, that'll be between services. The third thing, um, those of you that are, most of you here remember, of course, Travis Shannon, our former youth pastor. He's coming back into town this Wednesday to perform um, a wedding this weekend <clears throat> for uh, Taylor Young. Um, I think it's over in Spearfish, but I'm not certain. Anyway, Travis called me, needs a place to stay, so I said, you know, you can stay with us, um, which, you know, we're getting ready for. Um, <clears throat> but then I thought of this. Bob and Tanya Young, Taylor's parents, graciously offered a car for him to have when he's here. Well, it's kind of like the Israelites that we've been talking about. They got sick of the manna. I mean, God gave them manna. Ah, we're sick of this. Travis didn't like the car that they've arranged for him to get because it's supposedly a ghetto car. I, I'm not going to go into what, whatever that means, okay? So, his instructions to me were... Um, that I'm supposed to try to find a car for him, and it has to be, this is also something, I have no idea what it means, a sweet ride, okay? <laughs> so if anybody has a vehicle that you are foolish enough to loan to Travis, and you think at least that it qualifies as a sweet ride, let me know um, after the service, okay? So anyway... <clears throat> You know, we've been looking at some 
wonderful truth in the Old Testament. And I've all, I, I love the Old Testament. Um, every single time that any text was taken, any sermon was preached in the New Testament, any time Jesus or the Apostle said, it is written, they were quoting the Old Testament. Today, the Old Testament's kind of fallen into disrepute in most churches. We don't pay attention to it um, because the sacrificial system no longer applies. Somehow we think none of the rest of it does. Um, that's, that's a grave error, and we don't really understand a lot of the um, statements, a lot of the truths that are in the New Testament if we don't understand the Old. So I don't know how long we'll... Um, continue to look at the what's called the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, and the, the history of Israel, which is really referred to as salvation history. What God did with the Israelites in physical ways are object lessons to us spiritually. Um, a couple Sundays ago I mentioned the even the architecture of the temple and of the tabernacle, it everywhere speaks of salvation and it speaks of Jesus Christ. It is, the truth of Jesus is contained in the Old Testament, sometimes slightly obscured, but in the light of the New Testament, we look back and we see, aha, I see that, I understand that. Um, so there is a, there's a little passage in the 30th chapter of Exodus. And if you have your Bible or have access to one in front of you, um, Exodus starts out very, if you want to, if you want to talk about, um, you know, page turning kind of reading, Exodus begins that way. It is the escape from Egypt. It's the ten plagues. It's all of that which is riveting. But if you keep reading in the book of Exodus, you might be tempted to kind of tail off and quit because it gets into all the planning for the portable church that God had Moses build, all the regulations for sacrifices and so forth, and it seems awfully boring. Um, but it's important. And toward the end of uh, the book of Exodus, when they're about to set up this tabernacle, this tent, tent of meeting, the Bible calls it, God called it, um, you have kind of an obscure passage in the 30th chapter, beginning with verse 22, that I want to read, and we'll read through the end of the chapter, which is verse 38. <clears throat> Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take also for yourself the finest of spices, of flowing myrrh, 500 shekels. Now, shekels is a, a measure, a weight. <clears throat> of fragrant cinnamon, half as much, 250 and of fragrant cane, 250, and of cassia, 500, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil, a hin, that's somewhere between a gallon, gallon and a half. You shall make of these a holy anointing oil, a perfume mixture, the work of a perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony, that's the ark of the covenant, the table and all its utensils in the lampstand and its utensils in the altar of incense. That's what's in called the holy place. And then outside of the tent itself in the courtyard, 28, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and the laver and its stand, that's the looked like a bird bath, and that's where the priests washed after they sacrificed animals. You shall also consecrate them, that's the priests, <clears throat> that they also may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister as priests to me. 
you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on anyone's body other than a priest, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it, or whoever puts any of it on a layperson, shall be cut off from his people. Now, cut off from his people means both spiritually and often physically dead. So God is saying here, if you mix any of this up for your own personal use, I'll strike you dead. Wow. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take for yourself spices, stacti and onica, galbanum, spices with pure frankincense. There shall be an equal part of each. With it you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. You shall beat some of it very fine, grind it, in other words, and put part of it before the testimony, that's the ark, in the tent of meeting, where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. The incense which you shall make, you shall not make in the same proportions for yourself. It shall be holy to you for the Lord. Whoever shall make any like it, to use as perfume, shall be cut off from his people. Now, <clears throat> I think there's a lot in here for us today, even though we don't necessarily use anointing oil, though we do follow the New Testament. James said, if there are sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church and let them, the elders, anoint them with oil and pray for them that they may be healed. Incense, some forms of worship still use incense. I don't know that there's anything wrong with that at all, but a lot, a lot of churches have moved away from that. But here in the Old Testament, this physical anointing oil and incense represents all through the rest of the Bible, and there's ample references to it. It represents something beyond itself. <clears throat> Notice that the anointing oil especially was made up in large part of olive oil. Everywhere in Scripture, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's, it, if you, um, depending on what church you may have been raised in, a more ritualistic or liturgical, the term is, um, church, which also is not a bad thing. Um, and I'm not going to veer off <laughs> into you know, the weeds here. But I do think that I, I'm grateful for the Bible-believing um, churches like we have, where we follow Scripture and we emphasize a personal relationship with God. It's not wooden, formal, dead, tinny. It, I trust it's, it's alive. But too often, we have separated here over the years. We think that um, forms, rituals, are somehow bad. They're somehow, um, only liberal churches do that. Um, that, you know, we're, we're at the basics. We, we believe the Bible, and that's it. Well... I have been in services, and I've been in churches. I've mentioned to you, I think, maybe a couple times when our son was attending Notre Dame. To go into that great basilica there at, at Notre Dame, um, and you walk in there, and you have people that I'm sure are walk in there who love the Lord. Then I'm sure you have people that are they're just dropping their kids off, and they don't know God, and they don't want to know God. But everybody's the same. When you go in there, it's just, you just are quiet. It's just kind of automatic. It, there's, there's an awesomeness to the architecture. 
and there are there the you know there's the crucifix and there's symbols but there's a sense of awe reverence there's nothing wrong with that a lot of small e evangelical christianity has lost a sense of the awe mystery wonder awesomeness of god and we're not very reverent we i think we can easily um, in trying to avoid dead wooden worship we can swing too far the other way and gods are like our fishing buddy you know hey god how you doing today give me five you know wait a minute all through the scripture, God says, if you even see my face, you'll die. Everyone who saw any form of God, all through scripture, fell to their faces. This is God. A healthy dose of that is good. And God drove this point home with this warning. You treat my anointing oil and my incense like, um, you know, buying something brute, you know, <laughs> after shave down at Walgreens. He said, I'll cut you off. It teaches us proper, not terror of God, not fear that he will, is fickle. The kind of fear that pagans have for their gods is that they're totally unpredictable. And you go up to the mouth of the volcano and you throw a, you know, you throw a young virgin over um, with a couple of sheep or whatever else, hoping, man, I hope he doesn't kill us all this year. That's not what we mean by reverence and the fear of the Lord. It's a loving, trusting reverence. This is God. The anointing oil then represents, first of all, I think it represents the the infilling and the presence of the Holy Spirit. He anointed, notice, they put it on everything. Every piece of furniture, the tent, and then the people that were there. The priests. And God said they should put this anointing oil on them so that they can approach me. So that they can worship me. Now this was restricted to just the priests. I'm not erasing the difference between full-time called ministry and those to whom we minister. There are some differences there. But Peter said, through Jesus, God is making all Christians, all of us, a nation, a kingdom of what? Of priests. We're all to be then representatives to the people of God and we're also to be intercessors from the people to God. So our lives then are to be anointed. There's a recipe here that God gave Moses. The details he gets into um, of the weight and the measure, and you make it this way, and don't deviate from it. The anointing of God on our hearts, on our lives, on our service. I think the anointing oil has much to do then with our life of service. Out in the community, here in the church, just our life. There should be a sweet, pleasing fragrance to our lives. That's what he's talking about here. Now, this wasn't, you know, skunk oil or something. When the priests were out among the people in the marketplace or wherever they would be, everybody knew the pri there's a priest around because of the fragrance. You know, everybody ought to know there's a Christian around. There's a Christian here in the lunch break room. Better watch our language. You understand? 
<clears throat> now, this is not the, I really don't like the um, button-holing, obnoxious kind of Christianity that there's quite a lot of, I think. Um, the number one thing that a lot of people believe we're to do, and we, we are to advertise for God. But a lot of people say, I just read this, read a little quote from A.W. Tozer here a couple weeks ago. He said, people say, our number one thing is to witness for Jesus, talk to people about Jesus. We're not saying we're not supposed to do that. But Tozer made this observation. He said, no. First, I'm to become qualified to witness. That's something changing in my heart and my life. So that there is back of the words I may speak a fragrance of life that lends weight to what I'm saying. Lots and lots of times the people that are the loudest yakking about Jesus, people who know them, observe them and put no stock in what, what they say. I was talking to Todd Holden, um, who cuts my hair. I got really bad, weird hair, and it's, anyway, it's a long story. It's a sad story. Um, but at any rate, we were talking about people that, you know, witness with no life to back it. And uh, the thought came to me, you know, if I looked every time you saw me, if my hair looked like I got caught under a, a riding mower, and just hacked it, you know, to pieces, chunks here and there. And I'm always telling people, you need to go to Todd Holden to get your hair cut. Tell you what, he does a good job. You need what I got. Really? Don't do that to Jesus. I need to have the fragrant anointing oil that, that permeates Maybe without saying a whole lot. But there's something there that people know there's a Christian in the area. That makes sense? <clears throat> Here's a couple quick um, recipes or, or ingredients in the New Testament recipe of anointing oil. <clears throat> we use that term a lot, anoint. And it's both Old and New Testament. We use it much today. We'll talk about preaching, that there's anointing on that service or on that message or on that song. I have heard all my life. I've been in church since I was a week. Wasn't a Christian all that time. But I've been in church all my life. I have heard, I'm, I'm thinking of people who were brilliant Scholars and orators and speakers, and they, they could lay out a sermon in interesting ways. But there wasn't any anointing on it. Now, frankly, I'd say this. The only way you can tell if there's anointing on it, you've got to have some kind of relationship with God yourself. But you sense, you know, that's... Good, true, whatever, but it's kind of flat, kind of hollow, kind of thin. I have, I have heard, literally, um, metropolitan opera quality voices. I'm thinking of a person who gave all that up and a scholarship to Juilliard to be a missionary in Africa. I've heard... I've heard that kind of singing, and it just speaks to your heart. I've heard every bit as good voices and musicians, and they play, and they sing, and it's cardboardish. It's dead. What's the difference? What's the difference? It is that peculiar oil anointing, fragrance of the Holy Spirit, 
And, and he never has anything to do with someone who doesn't put the improper ingredients into the fragrance. He specified certain spices here. But in our lives, there's a couple of ingredients. One, utter consecration. 500 shekels of that. Okay? Total, complete, Lord, I'm not in this. I'm not doing this for, for me. I am yours. You use me where you want, and you use me not where you choose not to. Everyone is willing to be a famous household name for God. What about being never heard of? Will do that too? It's the total Lord, like Isaiah, here am I, send me. Do with me what you want. I'm yours. You use me however you see fit. A second ingredient is similar here, but it's unto God, not unto men. All of our service, the Bible says, is to be as unto Christ, not unto people. Not for the applause of the crowd. Sometimes you may get the applaud of the crowd, but there's hollowness in here because you know, I didn't do that for Jesus' sake. Does that make any sense? I feel like, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but especially, I think, preaching. I'm, virtually every time I have to speak someplace, whether it's here or wherever, there's always a little bit of a process to go through. I think the devil fights you and works on you, and you start thinking, okay, what if I flop? What if they invited me and flew me out to here, to all you know, to wherever, and they spent money, and I'm supposed to speak, and what if I end up being a dud? It's a real high chance of that, okay? I already know the odds are really good. This is going to be a bomb. <clears throat> You have, to go th you have to get to a place when you pray, okay, Lord, if it's a bomb. Just help me say what you want said, the way you want it said, and then help me shut up. Especially that last part, which I know a lot of you pray over that. Um, you've got to get to that place, I think, every time you serve. Lord, if it doesn't bring any... If people think, man, we're never inviting that guy back again. So be it. This isn't about him making me look good. This is about us doing our best to make him look good. A surefire, to me, revelation. A month or two after I got saved, that I still needed a second work of God in my heart to purge me out of the way was my first invitation to speak as a college student at a youth retreat. And all of my time was spent trying to think of stories and, you know, whatever else that I knew, or hoped at least, would really impress the kids. And of, above all things, they would be saying to one another, he's a cool Dude. You just drop one letter from the word dude and you get dud. Um, but anyway. God just really spoke, because I was praying, oh God help me to know what to say. And, it th and, I, and it's just like God kindly whispered to me, are you worried more about you or about me? Well, that brought me up good and short, and I realized, I got something in here that better get taken out. It's unto God, not men. There was a woman I knew from the beginning of my memory. She was in the first church I remember my father pastoring. He went there when he was in seminary. We were in Vancouver, Washington. Ruby Hall was her name. 
She was, from what I could tell, of course, I was six, so how do I know? But she seemed to be, she was a good musician. She played the piano. She could lead a little choir and, you know, whatever. It was a small church, I don't know, 60, 80 people. Um, but she was just faithful as the day is long, and she served wherever she could serve. Didn't matter. Ruby Hall was the kind of person who <clears throat> didn't matter who got the credit. Didn't matter she, if there was a need, she'd do it. And I can remember hearing my parents talking about Ruby, um, that somebody came to the church. The church began to grow, and somebody came to the church and played the piano better than she could. What happens in those kind of cases? Remember, I've been in church since I was a week old. I know all about that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter if you're the most caterwauling, whatever. I want to sing because she can't, she's not been here as long, and I want to. That's, you know what we used to call, what the music <laughs> department used to be called in seminary? The war department. <laughs> Seriously, that was just the standard deal. But it's not only there. It's just everywhere you have people who don't have the fragrant anointing oil of, Lord, this is to you, not to me. As soon as Ruby found out this other woman could play the piano better than her, she said, hey, you play, I'll lead the choir. I won't have to do both. Somebody else came along that could lead the choir better. She said, I'll, I'll be in the nursery. That's religion. That's heart religion. She was absolutely filled with fragrance of service for Jesus' sake and nobody else's. Her son, you know, what are the chances of even knowing somebody that went through this. Her son was the last, if not the last, maybe second to last, shot down. He was in the Blue Angels for a while. He was a pilot of pilots. Shot down in Vietnam, showed up on the very final, second to the last list of POWs. And if you recall those days when they were finally negotiated an end, they were letting the prisoner of war go, the ones who had been longest, to the ones who had been shortest, kept in captivity. And so she thought, well, he's going to be, it's going to be a while, but they have him on a list. The final, final list that North Vietnam released of POWs, his name was on, not on it. And that's been 50-some years, not a word since. Ruby's in heaven now. You've got to be, Lord, thy will be done, kind of a person. All the way from stepping away from playing the piano, if somebody's better, to never knowing what happened to your son. That's religion. That has a sweet fragrance about it. Also, this anointing oil is lasting. Um, it doesn't go away quickly. It doesn't evaporate like cheap perfume. It's, it lingers. <clears throat> it relies on God for my help. When I'm tired and I don't feel like doing it. Listen, there are a lot of times... Um, A.W. Tozer put, had this little quote. He said, in the church world, he said, at least 85% of all the work that's done in the church is done by people who don't feel like it. You know that? It's probably true. There's a lot of times I don't feel like reading my Bible and praying, but you just do it. There's a lot of times I feel, I usually don't feel this on Sunday mornings. I don't know why. Sometimes I do. But sometimes in the middle of the week, you know, whatever's been going on, and I've got to teach Wednesday night class. And I think, okay, I don't know. I'm not happy about the subject I'm looking at. It's not coming together. It's not clicking. Man, I wish I could. I don't want to go to church on Wednesday night. <laughs> Now, if that means I'm, you know, a hopeless case, I'm confessing to it. But what do you do? You just pray and say, Lord, look, there are going to be people there. I don't know what you might want to do. I don't know who might be spoken to. So help me, give me the strength. Every single time when I've thought, boy, I wish I could not have to preach today or not have to do, I'm tired. 
when I end up setting the alarm here and walking out, I'm not even close to as tired as I was before I started. Because I did it by the grace of God. You say, Lord, I, you got to help me. Give me strength to do it. All of us know what that's like, and we're glad that we did it afterwards. Let me just throw this in real quick. It comes to my mind. We're heading back into the fall. We're heading back into the Wednesday activities. We've got we, the, the volunteer need arises um, or, or, or gets greater. We need, wherever it is, people that are just always here. Now, I know that life deals us some pretty rough blows. Things happen. We can't make it. I'm not even talking about that. But the kinds of things that often, if you get online and you're in any of these um, church conferences or any stuff, the number one worry, number one burden people have is if they're in charge of volunteers, trying to keep volunteers, trying to keep them faithful. Because it's the stuff you get, and I'm exaggerating, but not too much. Um, you know, we're dependent on you for the nursery, for instance. We're dependent on you to maybe help with the coffee back here. Something happens that is an issue. Listen, you, we're not on to anybody's case about it. Things happen, okay? But a lot of times, poor Lori Matheny, and she doesn't know I'm going to say this, she gets texts that, you know, 7.45 on Sunday morning. You know, the neighbor's, the neighbor's um, cat, they're down four or five farms down the road. We don't know them very well, but the barn cats had kittens today, and so we're just taking the kids down to see them. We can't make it. Find somebody else. Now, that'll make you, that will help me and Lori lose the fragrance of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I'm thinking... Don't do that. This kind of service is just faithful. The fragrance lingers. They're there. <clears throat> incense. I've got to do this in two minutes. The incense here represents prayer. Everywhere, incense is a type of physical illustration of the prayer that ascends unto God. And the same thing here. God, and, and you know what, if you've, the King James Version of the Bible always uses this phrase, sweet-smelling savor. It's a fragrance to God. Our prayers, our lives are a sweet-smelling savor to God. Um, not, I, I don't mean to, you know, use a primitive kind of um, illustration, but I don't know what is in our garbage can this week, okay? <laughs> We're counting down the hours um, till Tuesday. That's pickup day. Um, yesterday, the garage door goes up, and I hear some scraping and banging around, and I was doing something downstairs, and I, I hollered up into the garage. The staircase goes up to the garage from the basement, and I said, what in the world's going on up there? Listen, I'm getting rid of this garbage can. I can't take it anymore. And so it's outside now, Okay. It's not a sweet-smelling savor, okay? Listen, our service, if it's done grudgingly, bitterly, <sighs> so, oh, okay, that stinks to God. Our prayers, there's a really clear recipe here. I want this, 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 and this in the incense, nothing else. Incense is a prayers that ascend unto God. Do our prayers stink? They can. Our prayers can stink. It only takes sometimes one false ingredient. And it, the whole thing doesn't smell right. There's a couple of quick ingredients in prayer. Deep reverence. Now... I, it was hard for me. I, I am really old, and I cut my teeth on the King James Bible, and so I'm used to the these and the thous. Um, and when, a long time after I began, you know, reading um, publicly, 
more current versions. It was hard for me to break, as if it's a bad habit, it was hard, to me, hard for me to break the thee and thou habit in prayer. And probably private prayer, a lot of times I still do. There's some, that's God. That's God. Um, you ever gone to court? They come out and go, oh ye, oh ye, oh ye. And you go, what? The, the honorable, so and so, and they walk in and they sit down. Have you ever heard that? That's old. Can we get over it? I don't even care if I don't understand it real well. What's the point to it? This is different. This is holy. And that's what the word holy means. It's separate. It's not like everything else. We're not sitting down at the big table at Lulabelle's. We're in court. Do you understand? So we, we do some things to set it aside and say, hey, this is different. We don't treat this like we're down at Lulabelle's. This is court. It adds importance, sense of awe, sense of seriousness. Same thing with God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What does hallowed mean? May it be holy. May it be treated reverently. It's not. We, we don't go to prayer. We shouldn't. Go to prayer with, you know, kind of popping gum like a truck stop waitress. How are you doing, Jesus, today? I'm just glad to see you, Jesus. Well, hey, don't do that. There needs to be, Lord, you're God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. You're the most high God. You know everything. You know me. And as I come here today, I better have the right ingredients in here. Paul said to Timothy, you teach our people to lift up holy hands. That's a type of praying. The Jews would pray. He said, lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. That means impatience with God. Lord, you need to get on the stick. That stinks as an ingredient in prayer. Okay? You don't know what you're doing, Lord. You don't realize what well, you need. You've got you to gotta help me here. That's an ingredient he doesn't like. I've got to put into my incense, into my prayers, ingredients God loves and responds to. Reverence, submission to God, faith. I've got to believe him. He said, you can't please me if you don't trust me. Those are the ingredients to our form of incense. Lastly, notice the awful restriction here. After giving this recipe that you mix any of this up for your own use, he said, I'll strike you dead. I'll cut your soul off. The point here is he doesn't like anything fake. It has to be sincere and real and true. <clears throat> I have seen... Again, I've been in church a lot. I have seen preachers, and I think I wasn't the only one. A lot of people could tell. This is whipped up human emotion. They're trying to act. I've heard people pray and try to pray as if God is really moving them to pray and they are... They get louder and louder and they want God said, you try to fake my anointing oil and my incense, and I'll cut you off. He's not into fakery. He can sort of see through it. <laughs> he knows. So sincerity, <clears throat> reverence, faith in all we do is anointing oil and incense that is a pleasing fragrance to God. When we go today, as we leave here, let's do our best to be conscious of service and daily prayer that is a sweet perfume to God, 
and to those around us. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, help us with this through the power of your Holy Spirit as we get up and go, not to just let this drift, not to let it linger, but for what we learned this morning with your anointing falling upon those that have heard these words, may it be lasting. May it be lasting to your glory. That is our prayer today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glad everyone joined us this morning. Don't forget coffee donuts. Uh, Wednesday night activities start this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. You're dismissed. Have a great day.